Hey, mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm hanging out in my backyard and keeping me company is this uh, solitary specimen of Oreoboletus oriflameus. And uh, the common name for this is the flaming gold bolete. You can probably tell why. It's really a beautiful mushroom. And uh, we've had some pretty uh, bad mushroom weather late lately, so it's been relatively dry. So I was just delighted to find this. So I wanna tell you about the ID features and a couple of lookalikes. I also want to um, tell you about my experience using Google Lens to identify this mushroom because uh, I have a lot of, um, you know, receive a lot of questions about Google Lens and other mushroom identification apps. And so, um, you know, I did a number of tests on this and I do have an opinion that I want to share with you. Uh, so to begin with, this is a bolete type mushroom. So instead of having gills underneath, it has these lovely uh, sort of a um, spongy layer. And in the case of Areoboletus oriflameus, it's really nicely radially uh, aligned. You can see that it's sort of a, a lemony yellow, light yellow color. It will turn sort of um, a dingy olive color. That's sort of the color of the um, spores. And so as the mushroom matures, it will uh, darken in this area. But you have kind of a, a light yellow is uh, where you start out. Uh, the stem itself is this beautiful flaming gold color. You can see also it has sort of a little bit of streakiness. It is very smooth. And uh, right around the top, basically you have these little, um, you know, uh, vertical lines. It's a little bit of wrinkliness, but it is very smooth, very consistent. Uh, so, you know, it's um, not like reticulation, which is sort of this interlocking, uh, you know, net uh, that sort of superimposes itself on the top of a mushroom. It's much more uh, wrinkly. Um, so this mushroom definitely, uh, yeah, oh, oh, I guess additional features. I forgot to talk about the cap. So the top of the cap of this mushroom is really fun uh, to me. It looks very velvety and it feels a little bit soft, but it isn't uh, velvety or plushy, anything like that. But it does have the appearance uh, sort of of a 1970s couch or something similar. So oftentimes it's sort of this, uh, you know, uh, slightly multicolored and really does look like fabric on the top although it doesn't feel that way. Uh, Edibility-wise, you could probably eat this mushroom, but it smells like leaf litter. So, you know, um, as with many, many boletes, uh, it's edible, and bolete just means uh, the type of mushrooms that have these, uh, you know, um, uh, pores or uh, sponge underneath as opposed to, you know, gills or something like that. Anyway, uh, lots of boletes are edible, and some of them are really, really good. In this case, is probably unremarkable, uh, to say the least. So, as far as lookalikes are concerned, in North Carolina we have two that I'd like to mention. Uh, both of them are, you know, as far as I know, harmless mushrooms, but not, you know, they're similarly on that list of like, well, if you had to survive, then maybe you'd eat it. I have a uh, sort of metric or a benchmark that I apply for edible mushrooms things that are better or worse than a hot pocket. And I would definitely put, you know, Areoboletus oriflameus and its lookalikes in the definitely less satisfying than a hot pocket territory. So um, the, the mushrooms that are uh, considered lookalikes, one is Redoboletus ornitipes. Uh, it tends to be a much larger mushroom and a lighter yellow color. It also has a very elaborate uh, reticulation, so that uh, you know webby appearance I was talking about is very, very prominent all up and down the stem of uh, Redoboletus ornitipes. And again, it's a lighter color. It looks typically more like a chess piece when it's immature. It has this nice little uh, blob on top. So so uh, that's one that is considered edible and not terribly choice. Uh, the other one is Boletus curtisi. Uh, similarly, it's kind of a, you know, smaller mushroom. It is this, um, you know, bright yellow color. It's a little bit uh, toned down on the yellow orange uh, spectrum as uh, Oreo Boletus oriflameus. The other thing that's really distinctive about Boletus curtisi, and you you know you oftentimes see this sort of like tall, small, um, you know, uh, bolete type mushrooms, and if you pick Boletus curtisi, almost immediately your hands are going to be covered in a very, very um, sticky and uh, 
uh, rather lasting yellow staining. So I have like a very, very little bit of yellow staining and that's from rubbing the cap and I have a little bit uh, coming off on me. But if this were, uh, you know, Boletus curtisi, my hands would be covered in this sticky yellow uh, sort of, you know, deposit that is not all that pleasant to have on your hands. It's a little hard to wash off. So, um, on the subject of using Google Lens, because I promised I would talk about applications, a lot of apps that, um, you know, help you try to distinguish between different mushrooms and they have like a collection uh, or, you know, a key sort of situation, so Shroomify in particular, are um, typically no good. They, the basic problem is that their collections of uh, species are really, really small, so you're better off, you know, you're better off even just using Google than using, uh, you know, Shroomify, for instance. When it comes to, um, you know, image uh, recognition or OCR based, uh, you know, identification, I found it to be very unreliable. Um, and also, you know, that's consistent with my experience seeing a lot of observations. I saw one one time where there was this really uh, bizarre crust fungus that got, um, you know, identified as Google Lens as Hericium arenaceus, the um, lion's mane mushroom. So, I mean, there's a couple of reasons that I suspect that's the case. One is probably user, not user error, but user difficulty. So, you know, Google Lens relies on looking at, uh, you know, the mushroom itself and trying to identify it by key features. But when you start to photograph mushrooms in the wild, you'll start to realize how difficult it is to take a picture that captures everything. So I tested this mushroom with a couple of different angles. I didn't get um, a good, uh, you know, species identification one of the angles I took it from, I did get as a third of like four different options, Areoboletus as a, a genus. So I was pretty impressed by that. So I think that, you know, one thing that is a limitation is, uh, you know, what your photograph captures. And Areoboletus, it oftentimes, these mushrooms have, uh, you know, sort of lighter colors, but also really nice bright uh, rings on the outer margin of the cap. It's a little less noticeable with this species because it's so brightly colored anyway. Uh, but, you know, getting a photograph that captures that and getting a specimen that is in the right age group to really, uh, you know, identify something is a little bit challenging for the AI. Uh, secondly, the data that is used to pull together, uh, you know, Google Lens and other uh, sort of image recognition based identification. The problem is that we have a lot of data sources that are either unreliable, out of date, or are just basically really difficult for Google to tell good and relevant and current information from uh, information that's bad. And when I say bad, I mean out of date, something that has been misidentified because of course that happens all the time. And so very frequently, even if you are going to, you know, Wikipedia, you're going to find a lot of articles that are out of date. And Google pulls a lot of its information, a lot of its sort of authority uh, determination out of Wikipedia and similar, uh, you know, very, very large user generated content communities. There is nothing wrong with this, but what comes uh, down sort of downstream for users who are trying to use, you know, image recognition is you have a lot of really messy data. And then add on top of that, we don't have nearly as many uh, mushroom pictures on the internet as they, we do, for instance, um, you know, I have border collies. First time I used Google Lens on them, uh, they were identified as goats. But that being said, Google Lens is pretty good at, you know, dogs and trees and things that are, um, you know, very often photographed, very often labeled and very rarely labeled wrong. Uh, mushrooms, on the other hand, you know, you have a lot of observations that are incorrect, a lot of information that is not uh, hooked together. So when you have a name that updates, you have all of these databases and all of these websites that uh, basically, you know, have conflicting information. So the long and short of it is I'm going to continue using Google Lens to test it. And uh, obviously over time, my hope is it'll get smarter. Uh, that said, I think that I remain convinced that the best way to learn to identify mushrooms is to focus on breaking them down from large categories into smaller categories. So in the case of, you know, Oreoboletus uh, or a Flammaeus, I would start my search by looking at bolete type mushrooms that are bright yellow. And then I would probably get into the area of the Oreoboletus mushrooms in that genus. And I could start to narrow it down. 
that helps me basically stitch my knowledge together genus by genus. And also it's a sweet spot for me to learn because uh, the genus names don't shift as regularly. And then, you know, finally, and I think more than anything, the important thing is it's very difficult to get a really good mushroom picture that shows you or shows Google Lens or whatever app you're using what it needs to see in order to identify something. So, you know, in addition, you have the like identification carousel at the top. Uh, some of those choices are reasonably good, but it will give you an ID. Like in the case of the first few pictures I took, I got, um, or, uh, or, uh, excuse me, Reddy Bolitis Ornitipes. Uh, Google Lens really wanted it to be that mushroom and it spit that ID out every single time. It's interesting because uh, Reddy Bolitis Ornitipes, despite the color similarity, is a much larger mushroom, so you have a scale issue playing into this. And also the reticulation on that mushroom is its distinctive feature. Now for the OCR software, it's really not necessarily the distinguishing feature, but if you're learning mushrooms and you're trying to remember the names, Reddy Bolitis and reticulation oftentimes go together and they help you remember things. That said, I'm not trying to denigrate or condemn applications. I just don't trust them. And I think they have a very long way to go. Um, you know, if I had my druthers on the like tech projects we'd focus on right now, it would be with good data integration. It would be with, um, you know, uh, ensuring revisions are a lot more available to people when names get updated. But that in and of itself is a massive challenge that uh, I don't have the wherewithal. It's just, uh, you know, one of those things I'd put on the wish list if I could make up my mind. Uh, or if I, you know, if I were handing down edicts on the projects that the few mycologists who actually get paid to do this kind of stuff, uh, the kind of thing I would love it if they would do. That said, they are also very busy uh, exploring and uh, discovering new species such as Areobolitis uh, oriflameus, renaming it. So this has been in the past known as Pulverobolitis oriflameus, and then before that, Boletus oriflameus. So obviously mycologists have their hands full. Uh, that being said, I think that we have a lot to learn and a lot to be gained from studying things from a large down to a small, but maybe not super duper small, uh, straight to species on identification, which is what oftentimes the applications try to help you do. Anyway, that's all I got to say about this mushroom. I'm really delighted to find it because frankly, everything else is quiet. I'm being eaten by mosquitoes in a way that I am no longer cool with. So I'm going to sign off for now and good luck with all of your mushroom adventures.